You from the Gutters, episode 28. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning, the discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Fafford and the Grey Mauser, and to skip ahead to the recommendations portion, skip ahead to 10803. Talk about comic books. I don't know. Are you guys done fucking eating? This is a bonus episode right here. See, now I have to figure out a way to mock food and math at the same time. How I have a really good way. How about you go fuck yourself? (laughs) (laughs) I think that would be the most efficient way to do both of those things. Should we start? Let's just start. (laughs) Uh, Welcome to View from the Gutters. (laughs) (laughs) It's been recording for like fucking eleven minutes. No, you already ruined it. Start over. Yeah. No. Welcome to. Let's get it. No. Let's get a clean version of this. (laughs) Fuck you. you Episode over. Leaving. Cookie Jail. Broadcasting live from Cookie Jail. Broadcasting live from Cookie Jail. (laughs) It's episode twenty-eight of View from the Gutters. Yay. Yeah, right on. All right, I'm Andrew Chard. I'm Joe Preddy. I'm Matt McGinnis. I'm Tobias Panchin. And I'm Cade Reynolds. Hey, uh, we got a Matt back. We got, hey, we what, did. What? We got our five That is our That's cookie right. jail warden tonight. <laughs> mm. Yeah, he's keeping Joe in there. That's right. Keep him I in need there to be deep. kept in cookie jail. I mean, me and Cookie Monster, man. Yeah. Solidarity. Oh, man, Cookie Monster's out. He's on that carrots now. He got yeah. clean. Uh, not, no, that's a robot duplicate. <laughs> oh. No, he he made that statement under duress. Oh. He totally did. Seriously, you pan that camera five degrees, there's a guy with an AK. Wow. Uh, there's a lot of things okay. I didn't know about Cookie Monster. <laughs> He's deep. He's in deep, deep, deep cover. Deep. Does he work for the CIA? <laughs> I didn't, like a, like I, didn't C, like I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I'm not. I'm not. I didn't say that. I don't even know, I don't know why you're throwing letters anymore. around. I don't know why you're throwing letters around. Why is there sweat on your brow, Joe? What are you hiding? From I'm not. <laughs> I'm not sweating. I'm not. I need an extraction now. <laughs> I need an extraction now. <laughs> Cover blown. You just watched me eat a lot of food. I'm really full. Get me out of here. <laughs> I can't move. I can't move. I'm full of Arby's. Get my meat sweats. Uh, <laughs> I do have the meat sweats. That's what I have. Me and Homer Simpson. Uh, oh, this is this is going so well already. All right, I I knew it was. It's one of those. It's gonna be one of those podcasts. Yeah. It's been mm. one of those days. It's been it? one of those weeks. Yeah. <laughs> it has been it's one been of those. Been a long ass week. I think I said I was hanging out with Toby earlier, and I said it's it's been a long thirty five years. It's been more than just a long week or a long month or it's just been a long time. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. I said it to you earlier. No, I, no the thirty five years part, like I can't empathize with that at all. No, it, I of mean, course I not. understand that you're an old man, but uh yeah. that has nothing I'm to do with I'm in my prime. I'm in yeah. my prime. Yeah. I have a good bite mark on my arm from last or night. I may have bitten him. It was not you. I may have bitten him. Uh, it was not were me. you bitten by a rabid bat? I was bitten by a drunk person. And, was, it, uh, was it Kenny getting a little no, of his own back? Was not, no, I bit Kenny earlier. That was, I remember you biting Kenny. That was a love bite, though. That one didn't bruise. It was, I felt the love when you did that. Yeah, everyone You were did. very pleased with yourself. As long I, as you didn't break the skin. You know what? I was happy. Um, today. <laughs> Fafford and the Grey Mauser. We're talking about that book. Is it is it Mauser or is it Mauser? I've always heard it as Grey Mauser. Okay. Yeah. Because there's definitely... T- the reason I was confused is because several times he's referred to as Mouse. And well, yeah, they call him Mouse or Little Mouse. And so I wasn't sure, but I'm, I mean, I don't know that there's a distinction between those two words. So. Yeah, I mean, Mouser, that's like the thing from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the little. No, I'm pretty sure that was also called Mouse. Like, I think that when you put an R on the end of Mouse, it's Mouser. Oh. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, I've always heard to ca- as cats that are specifically there to hunt mice or Mousers. as Mousers. Mousers. Okay. Oh, that's we weird. learned something. I didn't T-I-L. know any of that. I mean, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania Dutch country, so my pronunciation and use of words is always questionable. That's but true. his his taste in soft pretzels is exquisite. It's it's among the most refined in the world. It really is. It really is. It's to see him picking out a soft pretzel is a thing of beauty. Well, you can't get a good soft pretzel around here. No. It's just no, not Because there's no Pennsylvania Dutch out here. Huh. They put salt on their pretzels? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Okay. Then, it's, then it's I like, it's, like the, it's like the big rocks of, like, the big grain. Yeah, that's yeah, what I like. Be rock yeah, salt. yeah, 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 yeah. I hate it when they don't put salt on a pretzel. Yeah. That no, that's ruins awful. the whole experience. Who would do, what kind of monster I don't do know. It, hap- it happens. Sometimes you see it, and I just, ugh. I don't like it. I like salty no, I, things. Actually, yeah, I used to get super pretzels when I was a kid, because we, we were po. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wouldn't put the salt on that, but that was because I was lazy. 
Oh. Not because yeah, that's yeah, a good yeah, call. Yeah, you gotta like lick the top of the pretzel before yeah. you put the salt on it, and yeah, then it like all falls drip off. Drip anyway. water on it, like a touch of the, and the salt would always fall off anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I remember that. So like literally, like I would just take the pretzel and then I would take the salt and I like I'd eat the pretzel and then I eat some grains of salt yeah. with it. That's good enough. That's, That's the way to do it. Efficiency is what that is. Did those come with like little cups of shitty melty cheese? No. Okay. No, I mean, but maybe the they stand, did. Like, the, the maybe stand. they sell them that way. I there never got the, them that yeah. way. Yeah, there was a I super. I cheese. think Super Pretzel was a stand at one point because we had them in Albuquerque and we'd go and we'd get the shitty melty cheese. I hate that stuff. I who would pay like eat out prices for Super Pretzels? They are well, so. Well, it was like the eighties. It was cheap, like two dollars. Right? Yeah. 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 Not even two dollars. Like no, that was the that was the cheap ass like shitty soft pretzel. Yeah. I don't remember what they were. And there was a place in this mall in Albuquerque called Wetzel's Windrock Pretzels. Mall. No, this was years before Wetzel's. Sure like Wetzel like, wasn't sure even around then. Sure it's not a Wetzel's Wetzel reference. was still like, like bending like them Wetzel's. in his basement. Sounds like sounds like Wetzel's though. It's. I mean, it was similar, but it was not Wetzel's mm. Pretzels. There was. There oh. was. There was. Anyways, <laughs> let's talk about Fafford and the Gray Mauser. Uh, uh, you picked Fafford it. loves pretzels. I did pick. You it, picked actually. it, Toby. Why don't you Why don't you tell us what you thought? Uh, I thought it was awesome. Mm. Uh, I think that uh, Mike Mignola's art is really, really good in this. I actually, in some senses, like it better than what he does on Hellboy. Uh, I couldn't really get into Hellboy until I read this because it's less stylized than that, and I think it actually works better in a general sense, but I think it works really well for this particular story. And I think we talked about this on... um, uh, Cosmic okay. Odyssey, mm-hmm. the way that he does like shadowing and layers and like silhouettes, um, I felt like that really, really worked well for this story in particular. Uh, uh, now, one thing to note about that, um, and I completely agree, I think that Mignola's art is absolutely perfect for uh, Fafford and the Grey Mauser um, to the point that the White Wolf Publishing books of Fritz Leiber's um, are actually uh, the covers and interior illustrations are by Mike Mignola. That's awesome. Yeah, and yeah, well deserved. Yeah. Like I just flipped open to a random page and it's done with this really great, like very reduced color palette where it's um, like blacks and grays and there's just like huge sections of the page that are just pure black that you wouldn't think would be like Mauser's shirt it like and it like blends into his hair, which is also black, and it's done with an eye that I think that you generally don't see, particularly in like superhero comics, where he oh, blends yeah. things together that you wouldn't normally think would be blended together. What's well, about atmosphere, not about yeah. you seeing all the detail, right? right. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that atmosphere <clears throat> synergizes with Fritz Leiber's stories really, really well. Yeah, I, feel I think like, it gives yeah. you kind of that grim and gritty, mm-hmm. like '70s fantasy feel mm-hmm. that you don't you don't see so much these days. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of cookie cutter art these days. I feel like, I mean, when I was when I was growing up and reading comic books, it was like, you know, like everybody loved Jim Lee, everybody loved Rob mm-hmm. Liefeld. I don't know why, you know, Mark Silvestri, but like I was always much more into. I always feel, felt like. Yeah, their character designs were like pretty and nice to look at, but there was never they, any, they, anything else They were really else great there. cover artists. Yeah, like but, they did really mm. great, like big splash pages. Yes, yeah, but it's like that looked really cool. But it's like Wonder like, Bread. There's it, nothing it was, underneath um, it. There's no depth. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's, there's, there's no depth. There was no workmanship. Yeah. Well, also and uh, like I, uh, the the artists I gravitated for were people that were working for like Valiant and stuff like Barry Windsor Smith, and people that had a much more and I don't want to say realistic but a much more they had much more attention to detail they weren't just drawing the characters to look like you know like they, they were didn't the look like they were, were posed important. yeah exactly like it was like much n- more natural like they, you look at Jim Lee's stuff and everybody always looked really posed yeah absolutely because also, that's what he's drawing they had more of like an artist mentality of it too because absolutely I had a photography teacher once that I would like show prints to and I'd be like I don't know should I bring out more of the detail I was in, working in the dark room and I was like should I try to burn in more detail on like these tires or like do this? And then he's like, well, if you were selling tires, I would tell you yes. But since you're not and you're trying to create like 
an atmosphere and like create a photo like you that detail doesn't matter mm -hmm. i think mike mignola has like a great grasp of like when the details matter and when they don't then that's because what... you'll see one panel where their shirts are like really well defined and you see the wrinkles and you see like all the weapons and stuff that they're wearing and the very next panel because it's action like none of that stuff is really right. visible because they're moving really quickly or like you don't that detail isn't important at that moment well and that's exactly the point i was i was going to make is that Mignola is excellent at this, and and he does it in most of the books that I've read of his. He do, I think he does it really well in Hellboy. One of my favorite Batman books is Gotham by Gaslight, mm -hmm. and that art is amazing. Like the way he captures that that period and that time, and his character designs are almost flawless. Uh, and that's one of my favorite things about this was that i i mean he he didn't just nail this art he like tattooed it man it is he like it's a home run mm -hmm. it feels so natural to read this book with his art style and while we're talking about this i just want to point out one thing uh chapter five bazaar of the bazaar it's like four pages in has my absolute favorite panel from this entire thing it's when they go into the shop and there's this hood figure seeing there, and you just see this like one big panel on the center of the page with a shop, and it's so beautifully drawn. It mm -hmm. looks like something from like an illuminated manuscript. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And really, and the attention to detail is astounding. That's one of my favorite chapters too. <clears throat> yeah, that was because a really good one. <laughs> what's so interesting about that chapter is like everything that you're seeing isn't real. Mm -hmm. So Mignola has a really great way of like showing you this lavish detail and everything, and then when um, is it's Farford when Farford goes in and he's got the like magic cobweb eyes, you uh, see like the detail of how disgusting everything is. Awful, so it goes yeah. from like how like crazy beautiful everything is to how just disgusting it can be. And there's those yeah, yeah those two panels right next to each other where you've got like the people are holding like exquisite items, and then in the next panel he's got the cobwebs on and they're mm -hmm. holding trash. It's, uh, it's really good. Joe, what do yeah. you think? I mean, besides the art. I, uh, it was weird. I was reading this, and in no way is it like any other Chaikin book I've ever read. And it's, I, I think he does a great job adapting it. Uh, I expected it to be kind of, uh, I, I was expecting him to kind of make it more like something that came out of his brain, and I think he was... I haven't read the source material, but it feels like he was he was very close to it. From I, what I know of um, the Lankmar stories, and I, I haven't read them myself either, but my understanding is that it's relatively true to them. Yeah. And I mean, it feels... The dialogue feels natural. At no point do I feel like he's going out of his way to make it sound a certain way. Um, and I think he does a really good job. I just, I was kind of floored by this book. I really liked it. Yeah. I'm a sucker for the fantasy, like, let's run around and have adventures. Just yeah, like the yeah. adventure stories, they always get me because I think it's a great. And, and that's the thing stories. that I really love about this. Like, everybody compares Dungeons and Dragons to Tolkien. And really, on the balance, like, there's some Tolkien in D&D, &D, but not that much. Hmm. Um, it's a lot more inspired by Fritz Leiber yeah. and Fafford and the Grey Mauser. And, like, you read these adventures, and they read, like, a Dungeons & Dragons adventures. Like, there are a couple of, like, not-so-good guys up to shenanigans. Like, they hmm. steal stuff, and they get into fights, and sometimes they fight monsters <clears throat> to get the treasure, and... They don't never exactly know what they're doing. They're just kind of making things up as they go along. And it's like, oh, shit, well, we were supposed to get this treasure, but instead we got into a fight and burned the building down. That sucks. Yeah, oh, well, right? let's go on to our next adventure. Yeah. Like, their their fortunes are always turning. Like, sometimes they're up and sometimes they're down. Yeah. And yeah. there aren't, like, there, there are newer things which kind of have that, like, this is totally a, like, role-playing game adventure feel to them. Mm-hmm. But because D and D was inspired by this, it does it without that kind of sense of irony. Yeah, that a lot of things that are very self aware tend to have. Yeah, the only thing I can think of in recent memory that is like influenced by stuff like that, but doesn't, you know, like draw any kind of ironic conclusions from it, is uh, Skull Kickers. 
I think is the oh, only yeah. thing I can think of that no, like I've had that bookmarked to read for so long. It's and I haven't yeah. gone very, like it. yeah, it's very similar in the like, hey, we're adventurers. Yeah, it's, it's adventure. crazy stuff. Super yeah, influenced. like it's super influenced by stuff like what's, this. What's, in, what's like, the, the guy's the, name? Zud. Something, I, something I Zud. Don't I, don't I, can't, I, can't I think you're right. Yeah. I don't know. Um, he he gave a talk at Emerald City that I went to that I really enjoyed, and I ever since then I've been meaning to catch up on skull kickers and i haven't gotten around to it and yeah. i feel bad about that it's good yeah i i had a i took a class at evergreen <laughs> yeah it was all about graphic novels and uh i there was a guy there that was really into it and so i read a few i read a little bit of it and i really enjoyed with it i think this i think adventure stories should be fun and i think i it's hard to find good adventure stories these days everything yeah. everything the stakes are so high and it was like i think a great adventure story adventure story the stake is always kind of the same thing it's like you die if yeah. you don't do it right you die and yeah. it's like I, I the started, world isn't gonna end and the city isn't gonna blow up you just die i started reading saga um because we've been talking about it a lot and uh it has that feeling of like you know, it just seems like normal but very quickly do they open it up and be like there's so much more going on here yeah. and it's like I, I enjoy that like there's a place for that but I do really love the just like small scale you know adventure stories where it's just like oh we're just looking for this treasure yeah, yeah we're just a couple it's dudes kind of this or... like crazy mix of like Conan and fantasy and Hellboy and like Tintin yeah a little bit like i just like feel yeah, like tintin yeah. was definitely influenced by like adventure stories oh you know, absolutely yeah. like it just it takes kind of all these crazy flavors and mixes to get them all together in just that right way yeah absolutely. where like it doesn't feel like an adaptation like it feels like a comic unto itself it's mm -hmm. just telling these stories yeah and they, the pace is really good too because mm -hmm. it's dense but at the same time like a lot of stuff happens in each chapter I think it's each chapter is adapted from like one short story as opposed to like the new Conan books where it's like six issues is a short story. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they're like spreading it out a lot longer, which I still really enjoy. But what I really like about these is it's like one issue, one story. Well, this was originally done, I think, under Marvel's Epic imprint. Oh, really? Which was their like create creator owned imprint back yeah. in the early. I think this was done in like 1990 or 91. Uh, yeah, oh, 91. Really? That's yeah. when Epic was. Because that's when they started to diversify. And I know Chaikin did other stuff for them on their epic line. Um, I might be mistaken, but I'm pretty and sure. And so I think yeah. it kind of reflects that older, like, more compressed storytelling that you used to have. Yeah. Whereas things today are way, way more decompressed. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I think it benefited, too, from the adaptation. I definitely think it's easy to take a literary work kind of jam it into a graphic format and be like, oh, there you go. Now you have pictures to go with the images yeah, so in your it, head. It says, uh, copyright 1970, Fritz Leiber. 1990, Fritz Leiber. 1995, The Estate of Fritz Leiber. 2006, The Estate of Fritz Leiber. Yeah, this, uh, this uh, volume... This volume contain, collects issues one through four of the Marvel Comics miniseries, Fafford and the Grey Mauser, originally published by Marvel Epic. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, this was published in 91 before Liber died, and uh, Liber did give Jake and Amignola his blessing to yeah. write it. Um, awesome. Well, if you were going to give it to a team, I mean, yeah, you could yeah. do a hell of a lot worse than Jake <laughs> yeah. and Amignola. Well, and, I mean, that's that's certainly obvious now in retrospect. I don't know how true it was 25 years ago. I'm pretty sure Jake had been around at that point. I already had a name at that point. Yeah, Jake definitely did, but around. I think Mignola was still in his like early I mean, days. Yeah. Jake like, actually already had experience with Liber because um, he was one of the original artists on the 1972 DC Fafford and the Great Mauser comics oh, when they were part okay. of the DC continuity and had adventures with Wonder Woman. Because oh, if you're going to have, if you're Fafford and the Great Mauser, who are you going to have adventures with? Wonder Woman, for sure. Wonder Wonder not, not Wonder Woman. Yeah. She's awesome. Yeah, she has yeah, a, I mean, it's like if you're Red Sonja, totally. who are you going to have adventures Favorite. with? Spider-Man, obviously. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. I mean... Now I actually really want to read Fafford, the Grey Mauser, and Spider-Man. Thanks. Well, you can read <laughs> Conan and Spider-Man. Oh, God. Yeah, they Red, did, they they did, did that Red miniseries Sonya. just recently. Red Sonya Conan and Wolverine. It was, yeah, it was Red yeah. Sonya and Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. But Conan has been part of Mar the Marvel Universe for a long time. Off and on. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Also Godzilla. Yeah. They say he's got to go. but What, Godzilla? 
Go Go Godzilla. Okay, Is so that really a song. I, I so. had some uh, thoughts no, 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 about no, no, no. this comic no, no. that are probably going to spawn into a greater conversation. So I've tried to been saving it till after everybody got out their initial thoughts. Um, now, I really, really, really liked this book. I, I can't give it an absolute love because of one problem. However, it is of no fault to the people who made this book. Chaikin nailed it um, as far as the dialogue goes, the writing goes. Mignola's art, perfect. It, I don't think that the book could have been as good as it was without Mignola on the project. Um, I mean, everybody else involved, this was an absolutely amazing book. Um, and the problem that I have... Um, oh, I, I did want to say I would recommend it to everyone uh, that has not read the novels. Um, and that's because I have recommended it to a couple people who have read the novels and they didn't like it. And when I was talking to them about it, all their points were, you know, extremely valid. So I, I so I would say that if you are a fan of the original novels, uh, it might not be a, a comic for you. Um, well, because I, 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 I have to say that my opinion, at least, is with any adaptation, you kind of have to look at it as its own thing to a certain mm -hmm. extent and not compare it to the not the the thing that it's based on. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I agree. But if you're if you go into it expecting the novels, then you will yeah, be right. disappointed. Um but it, it I absolutely recommend it. I mean, it's amazing. It's fun. The stories are uh I mean, the stories are perfect adventure stories. They really are. Um my my main problem with it is that um and it's not a problem with the book but it's a problem that can be traced to comics as a medium itself um when i say you know i really liked this i i would have liked it more having experienced the it in novel form i felt like there was a lot of character depth and uh character building that we didn't get to see because you know in the novels you can you you hear their thoughts you hear their motivations you understand the characters a lot more than you can get in a you know one issue per story kind of thing um and so it has nothing to do with the people who made it, but it has to do with comics as a medium. And and I feel like that is the case for quite a few works, actually. And I so I wanted to know... Toby and I what, have talked about this a lot, like, yeah. how, like how comics as a medium work as opposed to like film or television or, or books. But I, I think what I really enjoy about the story <clears throat> is you're getting different elements of that you know like when when you're reading a novel you're experiencing the characters in a completely different way than you would experience them in a film or, or a comic and in the novel you know you get their thoughts you get more motivation you get more depth quote unquote to the character but something i really enjoy about the comic adaptation is like the atmosphere <clears throat> that is something that's very difficult to ascertain from I... a novel with anyone but like an expert writer and just the flow of action. Like I'd absolutely to... agree with that. Um, I mean, one of the benefits of a novel is that you really have that time to be introspective and really learn about the characters and get a feeling for them and their motivations, and that's something that's often lost in an adaptation. Mm -hmm. And comics exist in kind of this weird intermediary point because they're visual, but they're not movies. Like, you yeah. have to convey all the action through these static panels and the interplay between the panels. Um, and one of the conversations that Chard and I have had before is about the idea of space as time within a comic panel. Mm -hmm. um, and I was actually pointing this out to Joe uh, about a comic that a friend of ours was showing us today where it does the thing where it's one big panel and then you see the character repeated throughout the panel kind of showing their motion through time and time moves as your eyes move. Mm -hmm. And so as a reader, you kind of have to have this weird control over the flow of time in the comic because 
time moves at the rate at which your eye moves. So if mm -hmm. you stop on a panel and study it for a really long time and look at it closely, it feels like time really slows down. And if you look at the panels quickly, like things are happening really fast. Yeah. But then you can also have the opposite thing happen where when the artist fills up the page with tons and tons of panels, it can feel like time is moving really slow because you're having to look at every single panel oh, and it absolutely. really well, slows down yeah. the rate at which you read the page. It, it's totally dependent on the amount of detail in each panel too because if it's one, if it's like a repeating a image like someone's head like 23 different times and there's not a lot of detail and nothing much has changed and they're just like talking or like time is going by or something like you can read that page so quickly so mm -hmm. the amount of panels doesn't even always determine yeah like how fast you're moving through something but like it's the it's, detail in the comic and i was thinking i was talking to toby about this i think i was mentioning the how manga often will like attack that problem where the really detailed panels will be panels they want you to pay close attention to. And then right. the action, the action like, will be blurry. It's blurry, and... it's fast, it's really rough, That's exactly and it's quick. What and so you up. move really quickly through it. I'm looking at a panel on, in, I wish these fucking, why don't comic books have page numbers? Sometimes but they do. It's in the first story, and they're burning, they're attacking the thieves guild oh, and they just yeah. threw some like fire at the guards they blew the door open and they're running in and it's just fire behind them and it's silhouettes of farford and the gray mouse are like charging forward and all you can see are their eyes it's just fire and then silhouettes and their eyes and it's one of the like most impressive panels because you just yeah you just kind of glaze right past it because action is supposed to be it's supposed to be fast like these guys are running at you you're now having the experience mm -hmm. of the guards that are in the next panel. Yeah. And I think stuff like that is so difficult to achieve right. in a and, novel. And that's my <laughs> ultimate point is that because comics are a visual medium, like, you know, in a novel, you're often reliant on the author's powers of description mm -hmm. to understand what's going on. And it can often be confusing. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody really loves H.P. Uh, Lovecraft for his narration but his descriptions are really fucking vague. Like mm. it's very, very hard to get a sense of what some of these things actually look like. And so in that sense, like the artist is really doing the heavy lifting for you visually. And you can see these really awe inspiring things that you may not get the same sense of from mm -hmm. a novel. But on the other hand, it can be difficult to convey certain things like motion and action easily. Right. It and takes a great artist. Like, yeah. A, mm. People are, Artists get mad respect when they can convey that well. Mm -hmm. When we were talking about Hawkeye a few episodes ago, we were talking about the uh, issue where they're in the car and mm. they're being chased and the way that David Aja really conveys motion and action incredibly well. Yeah, and the sense of speed, too. Like, yeah. It's right. all really like, difficult things That's actually a very rare talent. I mean, yeah. You know, earlier we were talking about Jim Lee and the way that he tends to draw characters in a very posed, very static way. Alex Ross is really similar to that, too. Where it's yeah. like a fight scene doesn't look like <laughs> a fight scene. It looks like, all right, everybody pose for the picture. Yeah. Snapshot. Yeah. You know, like exactly. they look like snapshots. And uh, we were talking about this on the Tale of Sand episode, which may or may not have no, been. No, it was the last episode. Okay, that was the last episode. Um, and, uh, yeah, just how how when he draws with a lot of detail it tends to like slow time down so there's those big panels of him walking through the desert where it's just you know he's super detailed and then in the next few panels he's drawn like almost thin cartoony line art because those panels are meant to move faster so mm -hmm. yeah like, i think as a great writer you can move things along through their excellent descriptions and excellent like narration and and dialogue and like move you that way it's like all about the skill of writing uh, an excellent comic often relies more heavily on the artist to move right. time. Yeah. And being like a master cartoonist, like mm -hmm. there are very specific tricks you learn about the comic medium that are unique to comics as a medium. Yeah. And you don't necessarily recognize that they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have an example off the top of my head. So one other thing that I was going to say, kind of riffing off what you guys were talking about, um, kind of as comics, as a medium versus movies or, or even uh, books, uh, novels, is uh, you guys have kind of been focusing on time and the visual aspect of things. But the other thing that comics really differ from both uh, television or movies and um, novels is you like you were saying you rely on a, the writer to tell you all these things about the characters in novels well in comics 
those writers can give you as much detail as they want or as little and you have to go to that you have that's, to you have yeah. to yeah. and that's what one of the things i love about comics is like we have all read the same book but we've all taken different things from it because we put ourselves into it more than you would in a novel because in a novel, a lot of times you're getting spoon fed all the information that you right, need. Right. And that's one of the things that is really, really great about comics that I think is even more intense than movies because with movies, it it's almost the same as novels um, in the fact that you're being given everything that the director wants you to have, that the actors want you to have. Right. Um, right. But everything's moving so fast and um you're not really given the time that you want to take you're going at the speed they're making yeah you right know. and in comics and you determine the pace at which you're reading so a book that's yeah. one of the great things about comics that i think can either be misused mm -hmm. horribly by a writer mm -hmm. or an artist specifically an artist most of the time when it comes to time like <clears throat> we were talking about um or can be used perfectly and mm -hmm. when it happens perfectly it hits and it's amazing and when it misses it misses yeah it misses badly yes that's exactly the point i was gonna make is i think a good artist can convey more information in a panel than you know uh, than a writer can if he filled that panel with words you know a lot of it is is the art i think and you see this in some it's not i think especially modern movies tend to just throw score on top of everything and there's no silence and there's no mm -hmm. moment to really catch your breath there's uh there I, I some of my favorite movies are and most difficult movies for me to watch are the movies um where there's no music and you're forced to take in like you're forced to watch what the director wants you to see and you're forced to assume that everything he wants you to see is important that everything is in that shot mm -hmm. because he wants it to be yeah. And I think a good artist does that. If they put something in a panel, it's because they want you to see it in that mm -hmm. scene where they're storing the Thieves Guild. I had to mm -hmm. go back and read that read that again because Fafford makes reference to stabbing a boy. And I had totally missed that. I had totally missed that because I was all caught up in like, we're storming the castle, boys. You know, it was yes. like, <laughs> I was so caught up in that that I had to go back and look. And yet you can very clearly see it. And yeah. you can very clearly see him saying mercy. And I was like, that's that's brilliant. Yeah. When you can go in and be like, oh, okay, yeah, that little detail is there. That's an important detail. I actually wanted to respond to that point and what Matt was saying. Um, so Game of Thrones season three uh, capped with the Red Wedding. And if you don't know what the Red Wedding is, I'm not going to spoil it for you specifically. But I'm one of the people who read those books when they came out like mm -hmm. 10, 12 years ago. Yeah, me too. Um, and so I knew that that was coming from, you know, since the beginning of the series, like I was waiting for that moment to hit. Mm -hmm. And somebody was asking me about how it was different in the book from, versus the TV series. And the comment that I made was in the TV series, you can close your eyes and let the, let it go by. Like the, right. it will still carry on without you. When you read the book, George Martin makes you do the dirty work because you mm -hmm. have to read all the words right. in order to get past the scene to the next one. And if you stop reading, it stops happening and it waits there for you to start reading again. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, you, I, I mean, you can skip over it, but there's yeah. no way that you can get through it just on momentum. That's... Yeah. And I think that that's something that's true to a certain extent in the comics medium as well, is that as the reader, you have a certain amount of control over it. Like you can glance over a really horrific panel really quickly, or you can stop and you can linger on it. Mm -hmm. And being a good comic book artist is about making important choices about what to draw and how to draw it and drawing the reader in and getting them to look at the panels in the way that you want them to. I think equally as important, I think Scott McCloud talks about this in Understanding Comics, which I cannot speak highly enough about. Um, <laughs> Scott McCloud himself I'm hit or miss on, but Understanding Comics. I think Understanding really Comics is excellent. I think, and I think it's important if you love comics as more than just like, Funny books with action, you know. Um, I think that it's equally important when an artist chooses not to include something in a panel. Mm -hmm. I think Scott McCloud says something along the lines that when you're, uh, and this plays off of what you you were saying, is um, when you are watching like somebody kill somebody else in a comic book, you're killing him. Yeah. You're because you're the one that's like. You know, and it may be happening in the gutters, and which right. is uh, where we get our name, our podcast name from. It might be happening in 
in the gutters and the spaces in between the panels, but you're still the one doing it. Right. And and that stuff doesn't happen unless you read it. Yeah, exactly. And it happens at exactly the pace at which you read, read it. Read it, so absolutely. Like reading a horror comic, the difficulty in reading a horror comic sometimes is like the no. really, truly horrific. Yeah. Like you can easily gloss over. That's and knowing what's going to happen. And... It's the same as closing your eyes. And yeah. Like the, and, and I think that although like there are some downsides to the comic medium, as Kay brought up, like not being able to see into the character's head as well and not being able to spend as much time like in that like that's maybe considered a downside but it's also just like every single medium has different has different things to overcome and to get you to think about what the character's thinking is more difficult in some mediums because you can't outright say this character is thinking this right now (laughs) you can't just say what your characters are feeling that (laughs) makes me angry oh absolutely actually uh, go ahead Kate. oh i was just about to say oh that is absolutely true and in most cases like I mean, comics as a medium is a very, very strong medium. Mm-hmm. But like all mediums, it will sometimes have its downsides. Well, yeah, I mean, it's no, there's no such thing as like a perfect story medium. Like every single thing that you like, whether you're reading it as a book or a comic or watching it as a film or a television show or an audio dramatization or what, like everything is going to have pluses and minuses like pros and cons and it's working around those is what makes the great creators like really great at what they do what you were talking about actually just reminded me of something um years and years ago i was reading the annotated far side and there's one of the strips that gary larson talks about in that collection that he got more hate mail on than any other thing that he ever did Mm -hmm. and it was called the the subtitle of the uh, strip was tether cat and it was just these two dogs playing tether ball with a cat as the ball and he got more hate mail for that thing than anything else that he ever did and like he meditates on like why that was like because he feels like he's done way more disturbing things than that and the thing that he ultimately came back to was because like you know if you're watching a movie or like reading a narrative or whatever like there's a moment and then you get past that. Whereas when you look at his comic, like it's a single panel, like you close the book, you walk away, you come back, you open it up again. Those dogs are still playing tether cat. <laughs> like they're never not playing tether cat. That's like true. that is That's always true. happening. And for that person who gets upset about animals experiencing violence, yeah. like it's just, it's like this never ending torment because it's always happening. Yeah. There's no conclusion to yeah. that. Panel right. Because that panel is like, you know, it's just it's, a, it's this moment in time that's right. like preserved forever, mm-hmm. and I, that's that's definitely the power. I think. Yeah, yes. I think that every medium, you know, I say pros and cons, but like every medium has its thing that it can do so powerfully. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's the greatest crafters, creators, writers, artists, filmmakers, directors, whatever. It's the people who are the best in their field that can really pull that absolutely pinnacle of what the medium can do out uh, comic books have been conflated with superheroes for a very long time mm. and people talk about the ups and downs of superheroes as the ups and downs of comics which i don't think is necessarily fair well because the thing is that i feel like superheroes as a genre may you know come and go yeah and eventually it may go <clears throat> away completely and we might not write superhero stories anymore just like we don't write westerns anymore for the most right. part but I feel like comic books as a medium have something incredibly potent in them that as a species we're never going to get entirely over. Like I think 500 years from now people are still going to be making comics in some yeah. form. Oh, well, absolutely. and well, we're talking about American been comics. comics since we could write on cave, cave walls. walls. And yeah. we're talking about American comics here, but you if you want to look at a country that has like a crazy healthy industry of comics you don't need to look much further than japan their manga industry is fucking ridiculous like every single person reads manga there's no nobody i mean like people like it more than others but i was just in japan and you talk to anyone and they can bring up a manga that they enjoy reading because it is kind of a universal medium much like much like film and television is here like Comic books aren't a genre; they're a medium, and so well, you know there's yeah. there's a comic book for everyone. And in Japan, there's so many more genres of comics happening than there are in America. 
And well, and there's more genres now in comics than yeah, ever have been before. before yeah. right? and that's, Which is I, and beautiful. I actually have to make a note because in one of the very first episodes, Charles rec- recommended uh, Project <laughs> X Challengers <laughs> 7-Eleven. Yeah, I love that And book. I actually read that. Uh-huh. And that is not a comic that ever needed to be made. I have no idea who that is aimed at. I, it's aimed at me. I love it. I want to read it. I don't I get that at all. It. And I always describe it as like a business manga. And I don't like it that's is, a weird too. And it's weird too because manga. by the end, like I was actually cheering for them a little bit. Oh yeah, but even you do. so, I was like, what is what is the point of this comic? I don't, yeah, I don't get it. It's like a historical. It's like a it's like a, a dramatized. Yeah, it's like a documentary. His, it's like a historical drama about. <laughs> 80s businessmen in yeah. Japan. Yeah. Hit it's us great. Up. They're late with the slushy truck. Oh no! It's so well, good. Actually, it was, it was actually kind of interesting because I found out that there were some innovations that they came up with, just their team on the spur of the moment, yeah. that are used everywhere now. Like, if you ever work in a convenience store or supermarket, like, you go back behind the freezer cases and you can load shit in from the back. Mm-hmm. Like the milk and stuff, yeah. they invented that yeah, for this, their Seven Eleven. This that's team of twelve amazing. Japanese businessmen of and course. women invented, that's, that's and it was. Um, there I, was I, but there was one moment of that comic that I absolutely loved that I have to share. It was when they first go to America and they like tour the Seven uh, Eleven headquarters, and they're like, "Oh, the secret manuals! Like they yeah. tell us all the secrets of having a successful business. We, we need, we need to get the manuals, and then we'll know how to do it. Like yeah. it's a very Japanese ideology. Well, it's funny too because they get uh, spoilers on the book because well, I guess we're never going to talk about it. But they get the they get the the manuscripts, and they're like, these are worthless. Yeah. And they basically had to invent how to do business from the ground up because they. I like, was just I just thought it was so fun. It was like you know going to the like secret kung fu school, and they're like, oh, here are all the secret manuals of this art that we'll like never know. How do we get like we yeah. got to steal these manuals so that we can learn the secret kung fu of good business and it's told it's told <laughs> the manga it's karate the the manga is told in like that exact same style as like a kung fu manga would That's be t- awesome. like it's i i love those books i can't i can't recommend them See, I, I think if you had fan, recommended it I, as business I, kung fu manga well, it's not really like that, and i can't right? recommend them yeah and like well, the other it thing, was weird it, to read but like i would never ask somebody to sit down and read that comic yeah it's good and then they have two other ones there's one it's a uh, nissen cup noodle <laughs> and the uh the third one is the datsun fair lady z the first japanese sports car and that one that one's actually really interesting too because it's just like you know they're innovative but that's what i mean like in japan there's there's a manga for literally they're making manga for people that didn't even know they wanted that manga and they're it's like, great wow it's about uh it's about women that uh saw i, I got nothing yeah i desperate it, housewives the manga, the manga. <laughs> there's there's so many cougar cougar town next to bear mountain the manga <laughs> um but something that's insane is like we look at our numbers for comics in America, you know, like when an when a single issue sells well, it's you know like what ten thousand is considered like amazing. No, it's a hundred. A hundred thousand is really really good for a single issue right yeah. now. Is it like I think Spider Man sells like sixty thousand copies an issue on average. Okay, and that's like one of the better ones. Yeah. Like, I think Diamond has, like, a cutoff or something at, like, 5,000 copies or something like that. Oh, I see. Like, I think the range is generally, like, between five and, like, 20,000 on average for most things. And then really big things like Spider-Man or Avengers is, like, 50,000, 60,000. And when something does 100,000, it's like, oh, my God, this is an incredible success. Yeah. I, think, I believe. I think the most recent trade paperback of... Uh, One Piece in Japan, which is the most popular manga in Japan right now, was like 140 million copies. Yeah. Like, it's, no, it's just a whole it's, other thing. Yeah. It's just like uh, comics on a different level. And you, every single bookstore you walk into has tons of manga. Every gas station you're in sells manga. It's just, it's so ubiquitous. So, like, I cannot wait for the day that American comics well, is like that again. Well, there, well there, and, there's a reason why it's like that. I mean, <laughs> comic books used to be sold on the newsstand. Right. And so Superman would sell, like, a million copies an yeah. issue. Um, I think, like, back in the 40s or 50s, like, the two biggest comics were Superman and Little Lulu, and they both sold a million-plus issues every time. Yeah. But Marvel and DC were getting screwed by the newsstand publishers. Like, yeah. they weren't making money. 
They and so they intentionally created the direct market so that they would have a higher profit margin mm -hmm. per issue. But they basically they lost the newsstands. Yeah, you can't go to a supermarket or a newsstand or whatever and pick up a comic book. Like you have to go to the specialty stores. Right. And their numbers have just dropped and dropped yeah. and dropped. And they, you know, it's gone up and down. But comic book shops only really like came into existence with. The direct market like yeah in the like 80s. very late 80s yep yeah they in the forward to crisis on infinite earth yeah they talk about how that miniseries was only possible because the direct market existed now yeah. right because something that supermarkets looked for when they were purchasing comics was really high numbers was like the fact that this book had been around for a long time so it's like detective comics being in like the 850s and like action comics being in a similar number was what allowed them to stay on the newsstand yeah and every time they would start a new storyline or a new character they wouldn't replace they wouldn't start with number one they would just keep that the old numbering because it meant that the grocery stores would like yeah and that's why DC it. was like action detective I world's actually, finest the funny thing was when i started reading comics i would buy them from the grocery store oh me too i, me I too. remember going really to fred really meyer weird. when i was a kid and get and getting like sonic and teenage mutant Ninja turtles and batman yeah. and some places will still do that there are a yeah. few grocery stores and drug stores that still have yeah. the spiral comic book rack that yeah. you spin around and but for the most part, the, the, the comic yeah. book industry is People predicated the on this idea of the dark market. I mean, that's why they do new number ones every couple oh, yeah. of years. That's why they structure the stories they do. <laughs> oh, where, yeah. Because a story is told over six issues instead of one issue. Right. Well, uh, yeah. And yeah. it's good in a sense because we've had an entire generation of comic stories that couldn't be told in the old format. Right. But they're also kind of kneecapping themselves and... At this point, a lot of the comic book market is predicated on telling a story and then selling it as a movie or a TV series or something. Yeah. Well, and one... that's really got to change if the comic industry is going to be self-sufficient in the long run. Well, they also need to get out of the single issue market because yeah. that's just dead. Yeah. And the only place, that, like what you're saying, the only place that sells single issues are comic book stores. Yeah, and, and I like... would, I would love if more comics were written just as trades. Well, yeah, there's what barely a thousand comic book stores still around something, or something like, like that yeah. something, something crazy i think at the height that, yeah. in the 90s it was like 2000 yeah and then it dropped to like 200 and uh, it's like slowly built itself back up again yeah it's um kind of jumping back to what we were saying though uh like just before the death of wild storm mm -hmm. um the best-selling comic for dc was gears of war right and why was that it was because they were selling gears of war comics at like game crazy and gamestop yeah and all and you know uh, electronic and, boutique and all that stuff and yeah. it's just like there are hundreds of thousands more of those than there are comic exactly. book stores and, and you know japan has a culture of reading manga on the train oh, on yeah. their way to work and we commute by cars for the right. most part like people don't have to uh, time on their commute to read a comic book right well i, was, I don't know I, I i read comics while i drive all the time so. yeah no, totally. i like read them all the time. actually do i saw okay this is a total side story but i was driving on the 101 at like uh, I don't know. It had to be like two or three in the morning. Oh, it was like two thirty because I was gonna go to Jack in the Box and get some food. And the car next to me goes flying past me, and on his dash, on his steering wheel, he has like a tablet, like an iPad or something, and he's like touching things. And I hope to God he was using the GPS and not playing like Candy Crush or some <laughs> shit. They but sell he got, things that like strap yeah, on your steering wheel. Got, you can mount an he iPad. He got in front of me a bit, and I like slowed down to like stay away from him because I saw he was fucking iPadding. And then he's just like in and out of both lanes and like over the shoulder. And I was like, I'm gonna see this guy flip his car over. Because he's fucking iPadding on the steering wheel. Uh, oh, I, I hope that he had Comixology opening I, and he was reading a comic book. Yeah. I, a bad Because at least he would die happy. <laughs> yeah, he's probably reading uh, something from the new 52. Probably. Uh, is it true? He's like, yeah, oh, God. Uh, How can they do that to Deathstroke? Oh, my like, God. Well, you know. Uh, we're not that's gonna that's a rabbit hole we're not going to go We're not going to go down there. Well, Although, uh, read the blog the blog uh the article it's a blog post we linked to on the site you should read it you should uh tell us all why that uh, that's a specifically a blog post about why superman, superman and wonder, wonder woman, woman as a couple is a horrible misogynistic move yeah, yeah. on dc in part. more ways than one and it's very it's very well written it's insightful it's very non and it uh, got downvoted to hell when i linked it on reddit yeah because reddit is filled with entitled assholes yeah 
And you're you're saying the blog post is well written, not the comic book it talks no, about. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is like, and it's funny because it, it really goes at the whole like, well, Frank Miller did it, so we probably want to stay away from that. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, I I will defend I will defend Dark Knights, uh, the Dark Knight Returns, as an important comic book, but I will never defend Frank Miller as having uh, good ideas about what to do with women characters because. He is a yeah. fucking misogynist. He is a fucking misogynist. And he has and no good idea. About kind of crazy. It, well, also, he's, he's crazy. Yeah, just in general. Yeah. The funny thing is, you, if you read, you, if you want to see Frank Miller's, like, dive into the depths, read Sin City. It starts mm. off really good. And then it's just like, just Actually, nose dives into the depths. If you want to talk about bad adaptations, I think that Sin City, the movie, is an example of not adapt, like, it is shot for shot the comic book in mm-hmm. so many places. Like, they didn't turn it into a movie. They just shot the comic book yeah. like it was a movie, and it's not. And I've always had a really big problem with that film because I don't feel like it stands on its own merits as a movie. Like, yeah, it's a it's, comic book on the screen. It's really interesting because I would love to have seen someone make that without having any source material to work from. Yeah. You know, like if you made that movie without Sin City the comic. Well, the, I think it would be pretty lauded. I think it would be uh, yeah. like this is something different and in, in a new direction. I think you have crazy. to consider it separate. It's like Sin City itself is so theatrical. Mm. It's already so theatrical that you really don't need to do any adaptations. But like um, the Maltese Falcon, which is an incredible film uh, based on an incredible book. I think he changes uh, uh, what's his face changed like two lines of dialogue and that whole thing uh roman polanski when he made rosemary's baby like kept so like faithful to the book that it's i mean he doesn't change anything like everything is taken from the book as a counterpoint though he when he adapted uh the club dumas into the ninth gate he basically took like 70 percent of that book and just threw it completely out the window and then took the B plot, which was like a dodge yeah, and had nothing to do with what actually was totally going on, made and made that plot. into the movie. Which like is, uh, it has so little to do with yeah. the book, and it's so much of a better movie than the book was a book. Not that I don't like uh, Arturo Perez Reverte because he does some good stuff, but I love that, that movie is a lot better than the book. I actually like them both for separate reasons. I really like the idea of the book. I I, I like, like Captain the movie Alatrice, too. Yeah. but I do not like the Club Dumas. I like the uh, the Flanders panel. Is the I one didn't I care for that one as much. See, I I, I think it's because it's maybe a little bit more on the Dan Brown side of things. But yeah. Like if Dan Brown could actually write a decent <laughs> movie or uh, book, yeah. I, I, hey, he wrote one that I like. Well, I, I found the I found the reveal a little bit unbelievable, and I'm not going to say what that is because I don't even remember what that. it was. So you'd be spoiling it for me again. I'm a sucker for a trashy mystery novel. Uh, no, so. you know I'll I loan love, you the Flanders panel. I love trashy crime fiction and stuff like that it's all and i all i read right now is like ludlum and really shitty I I stuff about it. Right. um <laughs> but even even i think that there's probably only one good dan brown book yeah, i don't think there's any i like deception point deception point was all right i was gonna say of all the books it's definitely the best definitely that's the, the one that's, that's the only one i can read again. just saying it was good yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's good but i enjoyed it I feel like no, 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 Dan Brown, different. I feel the same way about Dan Brown that I do about Superman Returns. I read his books, and I was like, yeah, it's pretty good. Don't think about that. 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 Oh, it was shitty. It was shitty. It was shitty. Shit, shitty. I got Which is exactly... 30 pages into Angels of Demons. I closed it. I threw it across the room. It's and then I went and I yelled at the person who loaned it to me. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> bastard. How dare you sully my eyes with this tripe. Exactly. You know, that actually sounds like something. Yeah. It's, no, absolutely. I can see that. Uh, I want to talk about Farford because I haven't gotten to talk about it yet. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Can I talk about it? No. Go for God, it. Oh, okay. geez, dude. Bro, Only if you start it? pronouncing it Fafford. Fafford? Is it? I think Fafford. it's Fafford. Fafford. It's Fafford. Yeah. Fafford. Fafford and, Faffing and what what Fafford does, he faffs about. I just wanted to talk about that. I liked it a lot. I thought it was really good. I love these adventure stories. I love Conan. I love what it reminds yeah, me of. No, totally. And I think that the art is fantastic. We touched on a lot of this stuff already, but there's some things in here that I just think are so excellently executed, like the um, 
specifically the story with the curse of the wolves when they're like oh, wandering, yeah. out, they're wandering out in the wilderness that one in bizarre the bizarre and they yeah. have a yeah. random encounter they have a yeah exactly like it's just that kind of great adventure story was like oh we wandered into this weird castle and there's thing, this awesome there's panel a... where mauser is sneaking through the tower oh, and he finds yeah. the desk with the brazier and there's all these bones hanging from the ceiling and a crocodile and the art just like just... he's looking around at all this weird stuff and it's just so cool and atmospheric yeah, yeah i think this this story possibly is my favorite one and then just because i love the heavy supernatural element in it too. yeah like yeah. just they they basically die and have to fight off all these ghost wolves and as they're fighting mauser has cursed the 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 keeper of the tower to the same fate as them by making him also drink the potion right, right. that once they get that's in right, there it's a great moment oh too. yeah and they get in there and they realize oh they're fighting all these wolves and and men and stuff and then once the wolves and men realize that that guy is there they just it, completely ignore uh fafford and and mm -hmm. mauser and just take their revenge out on this guy and fafford and mauser get you know brought back to life and i just love that supernatural element i also really love the story where they move the house they they yeah. get that house and they move it to the place that where their own house idea. was and they both get one goes to the woman that's in the cage like the faceless one and the other yeah. one goes to the cave with the seven eyes there's the seven eyes and the no eyes and the no face right no face. Seven eyes no and face. No face. Yeah. yeah and so they each go to a different one and they each get sent on basically the same quest and they end up at the end and they're like uh oh, we're gonna have to kill each other, and then like a third guy shows up and just they're randomly, like, oh, we'll just kill him. <laughs> randomly the mask gets cut in half, and they're like, oh, well, everything worked out fine. Yeah, like, seems, just, <laughs> seems good for us. I love yeah, that. And kind then of they stuff. meet new hotties at the end of the story. Oh, that's like, another great part. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> our wives were killed horribly. <laughs> uh oh no. Yeah, it's funny because there's definitely a fridging that happens in the early part, but I, I don't. You know, and what's weird about that. And I think is really interesting is there's a lot you could read into that because I don't think that it's a fridging. I honestly think it's the opposite where in a, in a true fridging like that, those characters die to further the story of, uh, of the hero whose girlfriend got fridged or whatever. Right. But you're in it. There's a point in this book where once they've snuck into the castle, there's the creepy, um, is a necromancer guy and he's talking to a rat and he says i want the the flesh stripped from the bones yeah and i think he already sent the rats to go kill the girl oh no tell absolutely like absolutely. i think he just preemptively was like we're gonna go kill all yeah, of like, them that's the and it's plot only hook. on the no. request of the women are farford and mauser that they're Ma there right. farford and mauser sorry well, but, not that's... In the, but the, that's the only reason they're not in the house otherwise all four of them would die so it's like it's weird because it's there. The impetus is like, oh, you guys go take revenge for us. And they're like, okay. And it's only because the women were like, do this thing for us that they didn't die. Well, and that's, I mean, I, I don't necessarily, like, I don't use the term. Like, let me give you a second. What you're saying is that the women die because the male he, the male heroes have gone out to do something else at the request of the female heroes. No, no, I think they, they all there. would have died. They all would have died, right? Right, so I don't think it's just the females. And because like they the, died, uh, the two male heroes go out and have their adventure. Then they go wreck right? everything. That's exactly what happens to Kyle Rayner. He's, Alexandra sends him out somewhere, major damage comes in, kills her, stuffs her in the fridge, and then yeah. he comes back, and because of that, he leaves and goes and finds out how to be a Green Lantern. It's not, I don't think, I think there's a negative connotation there. I think this is well written enough so that you're like, okay, like, I don't think it's, I don't think that's the sole reason they're there. Well, like, you definitely my, feel like other things have been going on in, there. In my mind, though, it's because Kyle Rayner is a hero that that fridging takes place. Like, there's no reason for a villain to just put a woman Which in a I, fridge, Which I agree, right? but the fridging has nothing to do with, the fridging has to do with women dying so that males' arcs can be further right but it's only because the female was the minor character and that's like the female character to kyle rayner kyle right. rayner is the hero it's the male protagonist yeah in this story the ones that the thieves guild are trying to kill are the women right not the, like farford and uh or Fa fafford and the gray mauser are the side characters in this story 
the stories about the thieves guild taking revenge on these women see and i think that's Fawcett, largely i, think, I mean, I mean no, it's no, not i don't think it's necessarily something we need to spend 10 minutes well, arguing I just think about that but i think that's a i think that that's point. like really interesting though I, because, I, because it's like if yeah. fafford and gray mauser had been there they would have died as a side well, character yeah, but to that's... this other plot so like they would have gotten free i mean i feel like that's that's like saying if kyle rayner had been there when alexander was killed she would have been he would have been killed too i mean well I no, think no, the, no. the point I mean, is is that the difference he, they is... need they need a vehicle to get uh fafford and and mauser out of the city and they do that by removing their reasons to stay in the city can i just mm-hmm. interrupt for a second and maybe this is just me but I kind of feel like I have a certain level of forgiveness in my heart for historical sexism Absolutely. or racism. Yeah. Like these uh, stories yeah. were written 40 years ago. Like I don't feel like I can necessarily hold it against the story that it's more sexist than it would be if it were written today. today probably. Yeah, absolutely. Like, well, not, yes, that's probably judgment. unfortunate, making, but you know what? Still, it's the way I, the story was. I still I'm not think that it's, judgment, it's not. Though. It's not as sexist as the Green Lantern fridging. Oh, no, I don't think so either. And I I think think that it's really interesting. It's because. The sole reason that Alex is a part of that story is so that she can be killed and stuffed in the fridge. And I think that. Literally, and I don't get the sense. The way that this is told kind of feels like that, but in reality, it's like you're hearing it through the eyes of of Fafford and the Grey Mauser, but. The story was the Thieves Guild went to kill the Actors Guild, and it's only because she wasn't there that they're still they're, trying they're to still, kill her. Yeah. So this story is completely about her. We just don't get to see that story, right? You know, I, like that's just another that, the, layer of story that we don't get to see because Faf, like the story's about Faffer. It's called Faffer in the Great Mountains. No, but absolutely. like, it's that's... this weird side. I really, what I found interesting yeah. about it is like, I want to see. That story. No, I would like. Love to see I would love to see the story of like the thieves guild versus the. And I think that it's the fact whatever. that there is a backstory there that makes it not so egregious. And I just but think I, that I that's think interesting. That, I love it when any story can like take what essentially is a side story and like make it into a main story. Yeah. You know, and well, I think that's that the that's, mark of good storytelling is you want to know more about it. Yeah, and I also think that they're like fairly gruesome death at the at the fate of I was like I was yeah it was it was pretty you know emotional and awful and it just it does spur them into action to go burn down the thieves guild yeah but, totally you know it also gets them out of the city because they have too many bad memories there but yeah. they they come back and they don't go out and like revenge which i also yeah. is uh i i think deserving of of a nod I also think that it's interesting too that that's all contained in one issue. Yeah, and if right, someone yeah, wrote that now, that would be a sixty-issue yeah, right. revenge Tarantino-esque <laughs> revenge story, <laughs> where be, they have to be. travel around the entire world to, you know, find the person that killed their wife. Yeah, you know, like, yeah, it's it's just that kind of. I would actually love to see the Tarantino version of Ilmet and Lankbar. <laughs> that would be an incredible movie. Yeah, probably. Oh my god! Actually. I would want nothing to do with that movie. Oh, I'd watch. I the want, shit. I would make way to do with make that all movie. these stylistic choices and be like, look at that I'm going to play with the narrative and know the chronology is all fucked up. No, and I've awesome. just, just done like three rails of cocaine and I'm like really into myself and it's like the only thing that he can do is write a I, revenge story I hate Terry cocaine I yeah it's it. the only thing he can cocaine do cocaine and okay. revenge <laughs> cocaine and revenge Jackie Brown is great I love Kill uh, Bill Jackie let's, Brown's let's my not favorite yeah. get down into but, that Mr. Tarantino if you're listening to this please make this movie and prove Joe wrong yeah. I won't see it also, I think also do lots of cocaine you will see it you'll just complain about it for two years and then you'll watch it no. Have you watched, have say, you watched uh, Django, Django yet? I have not watched Django. Oh, okay. Because I hated, I hated uh, Inglorious Bastards. Oh, they're exactly the same movie. All right. Did you know that? Just because the director makes two movies, <laughs> it means that every movie they make is exactly the same. Anyways, did you know that? I, that I don't that, like, did I didn't that? dislike the movie. I disliked the choices that the director <laughs> oh, that, made, which oh, are that's the same really fucking oh, choices. Yeah, no, ra- yeah, exactly, rather yeah. than us all just making fun of Joe for the next hour, let's do recommendations. Right. I don't need your fucking approval. <laughs> real quick, I don't need anybody's fucking approval. You can't fucking stop me. <laughs> Joe, you have a sticker on you. I'm busting out of cookie jail, motherfuckers! You can't I'm get coming out. for you. Impenetrable. Oh, it's a closet door. It's keeping you in place. Was, was fun. So real quick, I never got to say No, no, I was gonna say, Matt, go. It's you. Um, go, you have 30 seconds. Um, all I really wanted to say is obviously I liked it along with everyone else from the conversations we had. The only thing that I was gonna say that I that I really liked about it um, is that when a really well 
written adventure story takes place, the best part about it is you never know what's going to happen. At no point in the story did I ever feel like I knew what was coming around the corner. Yeah. Um, and that's what I loved about it. And yeah. we've, already touched, we've already touched on the ride. We've already touched on the, the yeah, we've already touched on the art. Um, the other thing that I really loved is that they were able to take elements of a lot of things that I, I really care about. I mean, like kind of like the buddy cop story, you know, sort of thing, you know, the buddy, um, the buddy story and the great adventures and all that stuff. And they're able to mash it together and make a really, really well um, rounded story and a really well paced story. So yeah. that's what I really loved about it. Well, yeah. and I feel it speaks really highly of this, that the source material is how old and it wasn't trite and it wasn't like uh, insipid, like it was fun. And yeah, I did know awesome. it was yeah. coming, so well, that's like and pretty it's, impressive. It's cool. And uh, I recently sold a great comic find of mine to Joe. Which yes. was uh, Elric of Maldibone, motherfuckers! Yeah, which was an adaptation by uh, is it Roy Thomas and uh, P. Craig Russell. P. Craig Russell um, of er- uh, Elric. Elric by Michael Moorcock. By Michael Moorcock, and written, which was written at a later period than Farford. It was like the next generation. But it's um, heavily influenced. I'm pretty sure that Moorcock was like right after oh, Mark, Liber. He's on the back of the book, he's got the first quote. Oh yeah, well he's talking about Liber, who's like when were, when were the Fafford and the Grey Mauser stories written? Because I thought they were written in the seventies. Sixties or seventies. And uh, I thought that Elric of Melnabone was written at the same time. I, they were either contemporary. A couple of the Fafford stories were early fifties. Okay. Yeah, I think he was like that next generation. Although, okay, wow. Okay, back of the book. Since their first appearance in 1939. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was Liber's about to Fafford say. I think Mouser. there's some that were a lot earlier than that because okay. they were originally short story form in like magazines or something. So, I sold this adaptation to Joe, which I had read and I really enjoyed, and it was the, actually I have never read the source material of that or Liber's stuff, but that book da- it is much more dated than this book this book aged really well and i think they were only written about four years or five years apart because that michael moorcock elric graphic novels from like 86 and this was from 90 or 91 so they weren't written that far apart and this aged immaculately better so i think that says a lot about the source material that they were working from and also the quality of Mignola's the, work. Yeah, artwork. Mignola's art in this book is so good that it just feels as modern as it can possibly be. Yeah, I was absolutely astounded when I just found this randomly on a comic store shelf. Never heard about it before, just bought it. Just basically like, oh, this looks amazing. I will buy it. And then yeah. I read it. And then I had no regrets Yeah, for the last like yeah. 10 years. <laughs> I'd recommend it to anybody who... Uh, well, anybody who has not read the novel and has, you know, if you have very strong feelings about what Fafford and the Grey Mauser should be, don't read this. <laughs> if you don't, then this is a must buy. Uh, well, yeah, and I also think there are not enough fantasy comics, and so people often will ask, you're like, oh, I love fantasy, what should I read? And it's like, after Conan and this, I kind of run out of suggestions, but this is definitely something you should read, even if you're not a fan of fantasy. It's so good. So the first, uh, the first novella with Flatford and the Grey Mauser, Adept Gambit was in 36. Wow. Uh, I was completely wrong on how old this was. first Moorcock Elric novel was in 73, but his first appearance was in 65 in Weird of the White, well, or in uh, The Dreaming City, which would be later adapted into the novel Stormbringer. But so it's entirely possible that Moorcock was influenced. I mean, Mark Moorcock had a lot of of, uh, influences, influences, but... Also, Elric is, I think, a great uh, series, too, but it's difficult to read. Yeah. All um, right. You want to do Rex now? We can do Rex. Who wants to go first? Joe? I'll go first. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so my recommendation uh, oh. for the week. Um, I love this book. It, it's something that I, I really thought about when I was reading Fafford and the Grey Mauser. It's, it's an adventure story, uh, a lot very fantastical um it's called hammer of the gods mortal enemy by michael avon omin and mark ob wheatley and it really is both of their books uh co-created co-plotted everything um and so it's an adventure book um about a viking named uh, modi um who 
it suffers from a curse that if he ever touches a weapon, he will lose his soul. And so, um, so it's, it's an adventure story where he, uh, goes after the gods for giving him this curse. And it's, it's a very interesting book. The art is perfect for what it is. Um, a lot like Mignola's art is perfect for this. Um, it really makes me think of, uh, Alexander Skarsgård, uh, in the True Blood Viking scenes. Nice. That's that's what I think of when I read this. And I'm guessing based on the title that there's a fair amount of hammering that goes on in this comic. Yes. Yeah, there's some some sweet fight stuff in here, and it's it's Michael A. Von Oming is doing the art and also writing in this. Um, well, actually, um, most of the writing is done by Wheatley, but they both created the story. Yeah. And. Uh, um. And uh, Oming's art is amazing. If you've ever read Powers, mm-hmm. oh yeah, you know, no, I it, love Michael his, Avon. His, his art is fantastic, and to see it in a different setting, if you're used to the crime setting and city setting, like it's awesome to just see it as this, you know, kind of fantastic um, adventure story. It's really fun. I like the art in this a lot. Yeah, I mean, I I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Oming's art. I'm a big fan of Powers. Before it goes, like, batshit crazy. Uh (laughs) Big fan of pre-Marvel Powers. Yes, pre- Exactly. Exactly. Great. What do you got, Chard? Uh, I have a book that um, I just read the other day, and it kind of blew my mind. I went into my local comic book store. I was talking to a friend of mine, former roommate, Samuel Lucina, and I was like, give me just a stack of books to read. I'm bored. And he handed me a couple books, and uh, he was, like, pitching a lot of them. And at some point, he just hands me this book and is like, oh, and read this also. And I was like, okay. And so I was reading through the other books, and I got to this one, and it just absolutely fucking blew my mind. And I was like, what? The, what did I just read? Like, I loved every minute of it. It was awesome. It was really insane. It's called yeah. The Strange Talent of Luther Strode. And uh, it's, like, I don't know how to describe it, except it's, like, it's kind of like Invincible, because it's this kid who, by all means, is just basically a normal kid who suddenly gets superpowers. But in Invincible, he has his dad to teach him how to use his powers and, like, what they're for. And in this, he gets them through more of an accidental means, like Spider-Man. And also, he doesn't have a dad because his dad was, like, an abusive father. And so he and his mother are on the run from their dad, essentially. And so this kid, Luther, gets these this super strength and this, like, fighting ability from reading this what turns out to be kind of an ancient text, but reading this book and uh, he gets super strength and was like a really nerdy kid, like a Peter Parker type. And now is like a super jock, strong fighting person. And he dons a shitty costume a la like kick ass or something and like goes out to go help people. But that very quickly completely fucking backfires in his face because there is so much more to his power and people who also have similar powers to him and want him to use his powers in a specific way. There's kind of this whole, like, secret society stuff that's going on in the background you see glimpses of and you have really don't have any idea of what's going on. Second trade of this comes out in September. Um, it's an ongoing series still, and this first volume is awesome. I love the art, and it's, like, violent... <laughs> Uh, Joe just opened a page and his face just fucking Holy melted shit. off because this it's really intense. violent. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. it's oh it, my god! It, it definitely feels a lot like Powers, but like <laughs> ten times brutaler. Like, yeah, this, it's this... got that same kind of thing in, with Invincible, where like you'll everything's fine and colorful and great and this, everything's this awesome, what I and then to. you just fucking turn a page Jesus and Christ. everybody's in pieces. This yeah. is the second page <laughs> of the fucking book. It's just like it's just. A room it's a massacre there is people literally destroyed. a man that is dead and he has somebody else's dismembered oh, arm shit. shoved into his mouth yeah this book's <laughs> awesome i really like the story in this wow. and also the characters in the book i think are really well put together so although it is it does have a hyper violence in it, it the characters also have a lot of heart and there is right. like the intentions are good. They're right. not like, oh, he got super strong and now he's just a dickish Mark Millar character. Right. Like, no, he, he has good intentions. Like, right. he is, it's really well written. And, uh, yeah, the last issue of 
um, of the second story arc was supposed to come out last week and is coming out next week. And the author was on Twitter, like, apologizing to everyone because he's like, I'm sorry, I made it late. So it's a double sized issue, but it's the same price. So nice. the guy who writes it is wow. also awesome and a cool, nice. a cool, nice guy. Image so. is just like knocking them out of the park. Yeah, these days. and they got great creators. And I forget the name of the the author, but uh, definitely want to support people like that yeah. who are like Justin writing Jordan, great stuff. Spider-Man? Yeah. It, um, what's, uh, what's what's the name on it, Kate? The Strange Talent of Luther Strode. And it's written by Justin, Justin Jordan. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, just want to support creators like this because they're awesome and they're coming up with really, really great stories. And, uh, yeah, it's just it's a great superhero-ish story with some, like, very secret society type stuff going on. It's great. I love nice. it. Classic comic stuff. Cool, yeah. All right. What do you have, Jim? Have you ever wondered what the Marvel Universe would be like if it was set a really long time ago? Mm, if the answer I sure is have. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I brought Marvel only, 1602. Only if it's written by Neil Gaiman. Uh, I brought Marvel 1602, which would probably suck if it was written by anybody but Neil Gaiman. Uh, it's basically the Marvel Universe reimagined uh, at that point in history. And it's the Renaissance. Got all... Huh? The Renaissance. The Renaissance, yeah, yeah. exactly. Isn't, no, wait, wouldn't this be... It would be the later Renaissance. Yeah, it would be like the end of the Renaissance, wouldn't it? Mm. Anyways, it's got all your favorites in it. It's got Doctor Strange. It's got Nick Fury. It's got Spider-Man. It's got my favorite Doctor Strange. In it's it. got... Um, I don't even remember Doctor Strange. It has, You'll, if you put, well, Afterwards, I'll tell you why he's my favorite. It has okay. the X-Men. It's got Daredevil. Um, and it's Fantastic got... Fantastic Four. It's got the Fantastic it, Four. And it has a lot of characters in it that you don't realize are Marvel characters. Unless yeah, you've until actually afterwards. No, Daredevil's in it. Awati's in it. There's yeah. like all kinds of cool stuff going on in here. Uh, there's, there's some really great stuff that happens in this comic. It, there really is. And so it's 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 interesting because there are definitely people I know that I could talk to and like sell this, give them like a grade A platinum pitch for an hour about how great this book would be, and they would just be like, I'm not interested. Yeah. It's not for everybody. I think it really I think it works. I think that Neil Gaiman has is a is a competent enough storyteller to bring these kind of ideas that you're like uh how's that gonna work like he brings them together really well and he ends up telling a story that has really a and not just a satisfying ending but a really cool one too yeah. uh there are some uh it's a, it's in, a controversial ending it does have people. a controversial ending and there's some things about it that some people probably really could have been done like better it, but, but. I don't I mean I think it's I think it's a good book and it's it's a really I think the more uh, the better thing about it is not just a good book it's interesting it's yeah. an interesting idea that's that's it's a story that I don't think we've seen before yeah also it really is. the reason why it was written is also an interesting story in and of itself this was the book that was supposed to make Marvel enough money well it was supposed to it was the book that Gaiman promised to Marvel for the paycheck that he used to sue Todd McFarlane for the rights to Miracle Man, oh. which he ultimately won. Right. Right. So there's a great because intro. nobody takes Todd McFarlane to court and loses ever. There's a great like forward to this in one of the editions. I don't know if it's in this one, but he's thanking a lot of people, and then he, at some point he says, "And thanks to Todd who made this necessary." And people originally thought he was talking about like the letterist or something. <laughs> yeah. No, and of course to Todd. To Todd for making it yes. necessary, but then lower <laughs> on the page it says to Neil for keeping me in mind, Todd. <laughs> Todd uh, McFarlane, yeah, who of course so. left Marvel to found uh, Image Comics. And, and the right, only reason that... The, what I'd like to think of as the lost of comic books, Spawn. Mm. You know, Spawn had some decent stuff in those. Oh, no, it totally yeah. did, but I just... I remember oh, watching Lost. Lost. Yeah, I was, was going to say, yeah, so did Lost. Lost, Lost, Lost and thinking, this reminds me of something. What could it be? And I remember reading Spawn in those early days and just like, like there's no way he's going to tie all this shit up. <laughs> there is no fucking way he's ever going to tie all this shit up. And to my knowledge, he has. Of course, I, I haven't stopped, touched this he shit. He stopped for a while. being involved with it after like issue twenty five. So. Yeah, yeah. So, which was probably the best thing that possibly could have happened to it. So yeah, sixteen oh two. I think is one of those critically um, underappreciated stories. I agree. And uh, Andy Kubert does the art. Uh, it's really Andy good. Andy Joe uh, is Andy Kubert is one of Joe Kubert's sons. And it had such uh, a fan outcry that they made a sequel to it. They did. Uh, the art is stunning. 
to say the least. The character yeah. designs are absolutely beautiful. Um, and it's a it's a cool story. It's a good story. It's like, cool. It's really interesting to see how they reimagine these characters. That you're like, how the fuck are you going to do the X-Men in like... Yeah. You know, the the late renaissance. And it's like, oh, he finds a way. And it's compelling. And also the way that you can, like, kind of identify all the Marvel characters, like, really quickly without yeah. them wearing their iconic costumes. Some of them you can't. And, and that is they don't want you to. And, yeah, which, well, and one of the things I really liked about it is that there was one character that my friend and I were talking about back when this first came out. The only way I d- identified him was by a scar. And they never mention his name or anything. Yeah. And, you know, and for the longest time, I thought it was this one character, and it turned out I was right. We learned nice. a few years later, but... That's good. I mean, so some, so there are a lot of very hidden gems in this, and there's yeah. a lot of just, you don't recognize who it is until later, and then you're like, I should have realized yeah, it! Yeah. Well, and the great thing about it is that Neil Gaiman does not go into anything without doing his homework. He yeah. doesn't go into anything without doing his homework, so... Uh, he did his homework on this. All right. Great. What do you have, Matt? Um, so I'm going to butcher a couple names here. Um, but uh, it's called Battlefields. Uh, I actually pitched volume two of this uh, in one of our really early episodes, yeah, Dear, Dear Billy. Billy. Yeah. Um, and now they've come out with a collection. Um, I have the hardcover of the first three stories. These are, um, each one is a self-contained story that's... Um, not the, none of them are intertwined, um, but uh, they're all just different war stories told by Garth Ennis. Um, the art's done by Russ Braun, Peter Snurgeberg. I don't, I don't know. That guy's gonna kill me if he ever meets me. But it's literally in his name. There's a J B J in the middle, and I don't know how the fuck to pronounce that. Jorg, Jorgberg. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I got nothing. Um, and then um, we're passing the book around, so I don't even know what the last person is, oh, but their name the was equally as there. difficult. Oh, it's Esquera. Uh, yeah, Carlos, Carlos Esquera. Esquera. Oh. Esquera? Esquera, I think. Esquera. Whatever. All right, I'm white. Apologies? I'm I, I don't Sorry. know. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm not Latino. <laughs> but uh, I can't read. So. Um, I have mixed, feeling about, mixed feelings about Garth Ennis as a writer, but one thing that I think he does really strongly is war stories. Yeah, absolutely. Um battlefields is great war uh, war stories which is a vertigo um story or vertigo title that he wrote is also fantastic Mm -hmm. um he's also done some marvel um war stuff that was really good yeah uh basically anything i've ever read from him that involves a war story has been fantastic and battlefields i think is some of the strongest of it um volume two is is probably my favorite dear billy but all three stories in this hardcover collection that they've now just come out with a trade paperback version of um, are great. And they're all really short stories, um, so they're really easy to read. Uh, and the art's really, really good, but I definitely think that the storytelling is what captures it. And um, they're brutal, and they're honest, and I think that that's something that gets lost in a lot of comics today. Well, especially um, in war. It's published by Dynamite, who's been doing some really good stuff recently. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's... That's my pitch. So, awesome. Uh, well, take my monies. I yeah. think actually every element of the thing that I'm going to recommend this week have, has actually already been talked about on the podcast. It's um, the Chronicles of Conan, Volume One, by Roy Thomas and Barry Windsor Smith. Oh. This is the first volume of the classic Conan run from the 70s uh, that was originally put out by Marvel. Yeah. Uh, if you know anything about Conan the Barbarian, you kind of already know what this is about. But kicking ass and taking names. It's basically Aww, them yeah. taking the entire canon of Conan and kind of putting it in chronological order and going through the whole thing, along with a number of side stories that they just made up themselves. Yeah. This comic, I think, more than anything else, has really been responsible to, for defining Conan as a character in the modern age. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of just really interesting individual stories about this fantasy character's life as he bounces around and has adventures and fights monsters and romances women and it's crazy and it's Conan. Like you're not really going to get too many surprises, but the art is beautiful. The writing is really snappy. Uh, it, there's a reason why it's remembered really well. And after reading Fafford and the Grey Mauser, it's the first thing that came to my mind as this is a great follow-up. Yeah. There's nothing like washing down some Fafford and the Grey Mauser with a little Conan. Yeah. Definitely. 
It's uh, it's good times. Or if you read Prophet and you like Prophet, I know we've made the illusion that it's like Conan in space. Oh, space it, Conan. It wasn't. Yeah. Yes. It wasn't actually us that made the illusion. When Joe and I went to Emerald City, we talked to. Um, oh yeah, we did. Uh, Brandon Graham, and he said that he sold it to uh roy simon the artist yeah. as conan in space. we did the really? podcast first though yeah, and we yeah, talked yeah. about it being conan in space I, and then yeah, we were i, I, I remember we, specifically yeah, mentioning yeah, like we he talked, and then we went conan. and he saw he said that and we were like oh my god we said that on the podcast and then we kind there of fell was, over brandon graham because we're like we love some you. fan squeeing yeah, it conan was definitely yeah. like the closest me and toby are ever going to get to that moment in wayne's world where they go backstage with alice cooper and they get down on their knees and they start going i'm not worthy i'm not worthy that was like we weren't doing that but in our hearts we were because yeah. brandon graham was the one of the coolest guys uh, he's just like so just content to just sit there and shoot the shit with us for like five or ten minutes and uh Never felt like I never felt like he was like, you know, it, I think that was the second day of the con and I'm sure he had to have been dealing with people all day and he was just like super cool. Yeah, both so, of them were incredibly copacetic yeah. individuals. So it was uh, Simon Roy was there. Right? Yeah, Simon Roy. And he I was think also I said Roy Simon before. Yeah, I, I, it's I, been a long week. It has been. It has been. But they were both incredibly gracious, super cool guys, uh, really love what they're doing. And uh, we need more people like them. And we need more books like Prophet. Conan in Space. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And Conan on Earth. Yeah. We need... We need... We, we, every every place done. needs yeah. Conan. Yeah. We need... Now we just need underwater Conan. Conan Aquaman. is omnipresent. Aquaman. Aquaman. I am okay, Aquaman. Let's not do the Aquaman voice. Let's vote. <laughs> I will vote this is for Aquaman. Voting first. Uh, I think Kate is voting first. Kate, what do you, what, what do you want to read? Oh, I want to talk about 1602. All right, Toby. Uh, I also want to talk about 1602. Oh, wow. Matt. I'm going to go uh, Luther Strode. Oh. I am also going to go for Luther Strode. Well, he now, can't vote for it. Well, now I have to vote for 1602. Oh, but what about... No, that's that's fine. I mean, <laughs> but I want to vote for my own book. But I mean, that's... either way, we're, <laughs> we're reading... You would have to vote. You would have to vote for 1602 either way. Well, no, because cause if you didn't vote for this, I could vote for anything else yeah but it wouldn't it would still it would, it would still, still read 1602 1602 yeah, 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 is still what we're reading I think everyone should read Luther Strode and just like every week read I'm all the books going, you recommend but uh, yeah I actually really to. I used I'm, to own 1602 I really like that book quite a bit I'm gonna um, throw everybody for a loop and everybody's gonna talk about 1602 and I'm gonna talk about Luther Strode next week <laughs> I'm gonna be like I don't know what the fuck <laughs> you guys are talking about none of that happened in the book I read <laughs> Yeah. So I'm going to vote for Luther Strode. All right. Because I'm going to leave it's, here tonight with it. And, and to, it. to break the tie, I will vote for 1602, which is also a book that I really like. But yeah, I think it's good. I, I, would have, I think I would have voted for Hammer of the Gods, to be honest, because I also used to own that book and totally love it. I just have this thing about Led Zeppelin. Well, once again, read them all. Yeah. That's Gotta read good. them all. You have no excuse not to do it. Yeah. All okay, right. Now I have to break out of cookie jail, so. Yeah, okay. All right, let's get out of here. Thanks it's, for listening, it's guys. It's pretty hot Thanks, in guys. cookie jail right now. All right. Yes. Good See night. See you next time. Bye. Bye.